Hi, and welcome to Scholars Hop at Home. I'm Julie Lafford, Executive Director for Alumni Engagement at York University. Thanks for joining us today. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub at Home speaker series, which features educational lectures from academics at York. We're pleased to be able to bring this uh, series online to allow even more alumni and friends to hear from some of the university's leading scholars. As this event is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I'm aware that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you're currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you're on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located, which precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges its presence on the ter traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek, excuse me, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I am grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land. I'd like to highlight that although we're winding down uh, Scholars Hub uh, at, for the calendar year, we'll be back after the holidays with more exciting and timely content for you. Next week is our final week of Scholars Hub for 2020, uh, and we'll return on Thursday, January 21st with more. For more information about the speaker series and our other virtual events, please visit our website, yourq.ca slash alumni and friends, or email us at alumni at yorku.ca. For those of you who have joined uh, previous events, you probably already know that we like to get to know our audience a bit at the beginning of each event by asking a question. So today's question is, how often have you attended Scholars Hub since the beginning of September? And that poll should pop up on your screen now. And I'll just give you a moment to respond. Thanks for taking the time to do that. It's helpful for us to learn more about the audience and, and uh, how often you're attending our events. As always, if you need help with the Zoom webinar, feel free to click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is here to help. That same button can be used to submit your questions for our guest speaker today and to answer during the Q&A period uh, following her presentation. For those of you watching on Facebook, uh, feel free to submit any questions through the comment section there and the team will send them my way. So on today's talk, which is titled Expanding the Narrative on Anti-Chinese Stigma During COVID-19, Understanding Community, Complexity and Capacity, featuring Dr. Ada Mamuji, Associate Professor in Disaster and Emergency Management, School of Administrative Studies in our Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Uh, Dr. Mamuji is returning to us. Uh, she spoke to us earlier this, uh, this year, and her areas of interest are social vulnerability and capability in the disaster context, hosting and resettlement, international responses to natural disasters, and risk assessment. In February 2020, her research team received funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to explore the experiences of Ch Chinese diaspora communities in Toronto and Nairobi with the goal of developing destigmatization ugh, excuse me, destigmatization campaigns to prevent the unfair targeting of ethnic groups during infectious disease outbreaks. Welcome back, Dr. Mamuji. It's a pleasure to have you back today. Thank you so much, Julia. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So I'll turn things over to you for the presentation and I'll see you at the Q&A later. All right, perfect. So just give me a moment to share my screen um, and then we can begin right away. Can you see that? Yeah, you're perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, and I'm just going to put on video chat. All right, so um, thank you once again uh, for having me. It's always a pleasure uh, to join um, uh, your events. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about expanding the narrative of anti-Chinese stigma during uh, COVID-19. And really it's about understanding um, the community uh, a lot better than I think we have. So what, what do we currently think about when we think about the Chinese community and COVID-19? Uh, 
Um, and I have a slide here that basically um, is a snapshot of kind of the narrative that we are uh, um, are seeing currently and have seen from the start of the pandemic. So due to the geographic origins of the first major um, outbreak of uh, COVID-19 in Wuhan, um, China, uh, people of Chinese ethnic origin around the world have had to face unfortunate um, uh, discriminatory actions, whether it's you know subtle microaggressions or outright physical aggression. Um, and you know these are just some examples of what that's looked like. Um, so people from China have been falsely associated with the disease and blamed for spreading the disease. We've had references of the, the disease um, as being uh, the China, Chinese virus, the China virus, Wuhan virus, Kung flu, um, racist incidents um, that uh, have taken play, uh, place uh, in um, the GTA, for example, include this one incident here that you'll see um, where there was a customer that had an issue with um, mask wearing at um, an, an, an Asian supermarket in Mississauga. Um, and uh, you know uh, we've seen um, a number of different instances, and that's been quite well covered um, in the media. And so this is the current story that's being told when we think about the Chinese community and the pandemic. So it's a story of a targeted community that is victimized and vulnerable at this time. And um, what we're trying to argue in our research is that this is a very narrow approach. Um, and it does not paint the whole picture. And this is what my presentation is about. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, briefly uh, introduce the research study um, and then talk more about anti-Chinese stigma during COVID-19 and this idea of having, uh, really needing to expand um, the narrative and really focusing on community capacity. Um, and then I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so, as was already mentioned, this is a project that's been funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I uh, have a, a research team, um, uh, including uh, my colleague, Jack Rozilski, who's also in the Disaster and Emergency Management Program at York. Um, we have um, uh, uh, professors at Ryerson University um, in the U.S. and University of Nebraska, Omaha, and as well as a team in Kenya. Um, but what I'll be focusing on today is just what's happening in the greater Toronto area, um, um, and the research that we've conducted to date um, um, in Toronto. Um, so uh, quick overview of, of the project itself. Um, what we did uh, for this first phase, which I'll be talking primarily about today, is we conducted detailed semi-structured interviews with um, around 83 residents across the greater Toronto area that identify as ethnically Chinese. Um, and we try to ensure a broad representation of the community based on age, um, geography, like where they currently live in the great uh, GTA, their socioeconomic status, education, migration patterns, um, ethnic roots, uh, English language profici proficiency, etc. And we conducted these interviews in English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And um, you can find um, a full report of our findings in our initial findings research report that was released um, in August. Um, uh, but uh, what I'll be doing today is sharing a portion of, um, of, of the, uh, those results. And then hopefully we're going to um, start with phase two of the project in early next year, and I'll introduce that a little bit at the end of the presentation. So before I begin, I just wanted to share a little bit more about um, the uh, Asian community um, in, in the Greater Toronto Area, but pr primarily the, the Chinese um, uh, community. So in 2016, the census report showed that we have 1.8 million people of uh, Chinese uh, origin in the country. Um, and uh, this includes a very diverse community. Um, and uh, you know, while we might say the Chinese community community. This is by no means a homogeneous community. It's very heterogeneous. And that was very apparent when we uh, conducted our interviews. Um, and uh, there are diaspora of persons with roots in mainland China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, uh, and other areas. 
Um, and in, in general, um, Chinese Canadians have settled primarily in urban areas um, in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and so our study looked specifically at the Greater Toronto Area, where in some places, like in Markham, we have around 46% uh, of the population being uh, ethnic, uh, ethnically Chinese. And so I mentioned, I showed this slide already. So this is the current narrative that's being, you know, when we think about um, the Chinese community and, and COVID-19, this is what the media has been talking about. This is what politicians have been talking about. This is the sentiment that we're hearing, a community that's uh, victimized and targeted. Um, and there have been a number of different um, anti-Chinese, uh, uh, sorry, a number of uh, different uh, trackers where uh, any anti-Chinese uh, stigma incidents or uh, incidents of discrimination or, or xenophobia can be reported on these uh, trackers and we can learn more about the impact um, uh, that uh, uh, the community has faced uh, based on this discrimination and stigma. And why is it so important to talk about stigma is it's because stigma does harm. Um, we, we know that uh, when there's stigma associated with infectious disease outbreaks, fewer people seek medical care or, or testing, um, and uh, there's a lower case reporting. Um, there's definite negative mental health impacts, including isolation and anxiety. And uh, for members of the Chinese community, this is compounded by the negative impacts that all of us have faced during um, the pandemic. So, you know, um, people having uh, 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 just the, 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 the difficulty of having to stay at home and adjust our lives and impacts to um, our, our income and, and our livelihoods, et cetera. But on top of that, members of the Chinese community having to face the, um, uh, the added burden of the stigma uh, that's, that's taking place. Um, and, it, and there's also reports that stigma um, does lead to non-compliance with public health guidelines um, and, uh, you know, impacts adherence uh, to public health interventions. And so ultimately, um, stigma can exacerbate the spread of the disease. And this is why it's so important to ensure that we're adequately addressing that, especially when, when we're in the midst of a pandemic. So how do we do that? And what we're trying to argue in our research after having learned about the community and um, uh, you know, uh, engaged in these detailed discussions is that there really is a need to expand the narrative of stigma and discrimination. So while we acknowledge and condemn all these acts of discrimination and we realize that there is definitely an existence of uh, structural racism um, in Canada, what we are arguing is that when the conversation starts and stops at the, re the, the, re uh, the reporting of stigma, then there are a number of ramifications that are negative. First of all, the narrative remains a victimization of the community. That's all that you can think about when you think about the community, it's a victimized community. Those that are targeted continue to feel unsafe and many live in a constant state of uh, fear. And in fact, in some of our research that we've conducted in Kenya, um, when we were speaking to members of the Chinese community there, the amount of uh, social isolation and just kind of retreating from society um, uh, was at a different level altogether. Um, and then also, those that have discriminatory tendencies, they might take the number of incidents as justification for continued displays of xenophobia. So basically what happens is that there's a normalization of discriminatory behavior. You know, they're hearing about it, they're seeing, they're seeing it on the news, and they think, oh, it's fine, I want to I wanna be racist, I want to stigmatize the community, I can do that, and basically emboldens those people that have these tendencies. And then also for those on the outside, um, those that are not from the, within the, ch the, the, the Chinese community and those that are not perpetrators, we don't really know what to do uh, after that. It basically is just, um, uh, you know, we acknowledge it as something that's, that's taking place and that's it. So what we are suggesting is that it's really important for us to expand the narrative to one um, uh, of capacity and community. And so um, when you, if you want to read more about uh, both of these aspects, you can look at our initial report. But what I'll talk about today is this idea of the, the, the capacity of the community. 
And before I get into talking about capacity, just wanted to give you a quick snapshot, a reminder of the timeline of events that occurred. So we know that around November of um, uh, last year, that's when the first reported cases of COVID-19 were coming out in, in China. Um, and then in January of this year, um, that's when the central government of China imposed a lockdown in Wuhan and other cities in um, Hubei province. And then January 25th was the Chinese New Year. And that's also the same day that the first reported case of COVID-19 occurred in Canada. Um, and then uh, while that was in January 25th, the first reported case in Canada, the Ontario government uh, state of emergency was not declared until March 17th. So just a reminder of, of that uh, um, uh, series of events. But what you see here is another aspect of the story that's, that's really um, under uh, reported and that's not really well known. And this is really what was happening in the community. And what I'll talk about is um, a community that was being extremely proactive um, when it comes to their actions um, based on what was occurring um, uh, um, in China at that time. And I'll be talking about some of that here. So what were some of these actions? So mask wearing. Um, as the situation in Wuhan changed and uh, the fact that a lot of um, the Chinese diaspora community here in, in Canada are closely linked to family and friends in China, what we uh, were able to find is that many, um, many people uh, of Chinese ethnic origin here in Canada were starting to receive, um, you know, explicit warnings that something is up, make sure you're wearing masks, take extra precautions. And these were um, uh, uh, reminders that were coming from um, uh, people in China at that time. Um, there were also, you know, stories of uh, masks being sent from family and friends in China. Um, and so mask wearing was something that took place very early on. Not only is it part of the, the, the uh, culture and many, um, many uh, Chinese uh, wear masks on a regular basis, but it was starting to become a common thing that we're seeing um, in and around Toronto in January. There were also parents in the GTA that sent this, their kids to schools uh, to school with masks on as early as, as January. Um, and uh, uh, we also saw that very quickly, um, uh, 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 Chinese businesses also started to employ um, a mask wearing as a public health practice. So what you see here is an image from February 12th that was taken in Chinatown. And this was a, a poster on one of the Chinatown uh, restaurants. And basically it's a sign that's saying that um, employees are wearing masks, they're replacing them every four hours. And then it also talks about other responsible public health actions, such as um, uh, doing temperature checks three times a day of their, their employees and, and hand, uh, hand san uh, san um, sanitization uh, at that point in time. So this was very early on that these actions were being um, were taking place. And in contrast, um, uh, where we have some businesses, for example, the TNT supermarket, they introduced a, a rule where all employees and customers were required to wear masks in in their uh, grocery stores uh, in May uh, on May 11th, it was like a rule that was put in place across the country, um, and the city of Toronto actually didn't introduce a mandatory mask wearing policy until June 30th, and that wasn't implemented until a week later. So almost two months after some of these businesses, uh, you know, made this a formal policy, uh, was when um, our, uh, you know, uh, the our government officials started to think about making uh, mask wearing mandatory. We also see a lot of physical distancing. That's the next thing I'll talk about. So as I mentioned, January 25th was the, the, the first um, out, uh, the, the first case of COVID-19 in Toronto, and it was also the same, um, it was also the first day of uh, the Chinese New Year. 
And what we see is that many of those celebrations that were planned for Chinese New Year were basically canceled, people didn't show up. Um, and it was basically, if you think about it, an example of a community that's very responsible and, and really adhering to physical distancing and saying, we don't wanna be in these crowded uh, places at this point in time, um, this is a serious situation. Um, some parents also decided to keep their kids home from school to avoid exposure to potential cases. And some of the parents that we spoke to actually said that they did this because they had elderly living with them in the household. So all these things that, you know, we, we now know, you know, months later into the pandemic, the community was well aware of ahead of time. Um, uh, some individuals that had traveled to China over the break, they self-isolated on their own upon their return. Um, and then here I have a poster uh, taken on February, uh, a picture taken on February 11th that shows a Chinese business that um, uh, decided to reduce its operating hours um, as we have other examples of companies basically asking employees to work from home as early as February. And then there was also community outreach um, and particularly petitions to officials. So the, the community not only did these actions um, uh, amongst, uh, uh, you know, within the community, but also did uh, put out many petitions um, at the end of January, you know, to the House of Commons, the Prime Minister, Minister of Health, Minister of Transport, basically asking for things like increased um, quarantine screening measures and travel restrictions. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there were also press conferences that took place um, and also a campaign around spread, stop the spread of racism. So what you can see in contrast to the first set of images that I showed is that rather than just a, a, a victimized community, you have a community with so much capacity and so much that they did early on to help, um, uh, you know, prevent the uh, quick spread of the disease. And so what was the reaction? What was the reaction of all these proactive actions? Unfortunately, there was extreme stigma and microaggression by those wearing masks. Now we all know, we all wear a mask. But at that time, um, uh, people who were wearing masks uh, faced, um, uh, you know, uh, there were uh, remarks made to them, looks given to them. Um, and basically this was exacerbated by varying public health advice on mask wearing because at, uh, earlier on it was considered, you know, if you're, if you're wearing the masks, then it only prevents prevents you from making others sick if you're sick. And that's the kind of idea that was, uh, was uh, 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 prevalent at that time. So there was a lot of mask-based stigma. Also, there were school boards that banned children from wearing masks at school. Um, petitions that were put out were not you know, taken seriously and um, they didn't result directly in, in public health actions until much later. Um, and what's really interesting, this is an image of uh, the mayor of Markham who went to Wuhan Noodle to have a meal. And basically uh, he had this meal to, to kind of, uh, you know, encourage um, the general public to, to ensure that they're not uh, avoiding Chinese businesses. Um, and, you know, while, while that's, you know, there was goodwill around that action, what we actually noticed when, when speaking with the members of the Chinese community is many of them, many of these businesses that were facing a loss of customers um, was were basically uh, uh, frequented primarily by people of Chinese ethnic origin anyways. So it was basically um, Chinese members of the Chinese community that decided we're not going to go to restaurants right now. We're not going to go, um, you know, to uh, to crowded places right now because it's better to stay at home, better to to socially, uh, physically distance uh, ourselves. And so the narrative in the in the news um, and in the general population was that oh you know there are all these businesses that are that are being affected but in fact another flip side to that another story to tell is that you had a really responsible um, community response where where uh, you know there, there were efforts being made not to put themselves um, at, in harm's way and not to be um, uh, you know uh, contribute to that spread of the disease. And so um, unfortunately, these public health actions um, were, were indeed dismissed. So um, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we then um, help to better you know, explain this important capacity that the community had that helped us all 
uh, with addressing the disease very early on. And the fact that there's so much for us to learn. It took months and months before we, um, uh, as a broader society, were able to start to replicate some of the very responsible public health actions that the Chinese community did. So it's really important for us to learn from communities, um, you know, listen to communities and, and also in, uh, assist them with enhancing their own capacity. Um, it's very important to address stigma um, and, uh, you know, we can do this by focusing on social countermeasures like uh, anti-stigma messaging and public service announcements. But then also this idea of expanding the narrative, and we can do that through engagement with the media to highlight responsible actions taken by community members, engage with researchers so they can uh, basically help um, to, uh, to, uh, to in efforts to expand this narrative, um, and then to support communities with, uh, with, with the efforts that they, with, with they have taken. And, and who can do this? Um, basically, what we're going to be doing in the second phase of the project is that we're going to be um, engaging with emergency managers and public health officials, uh, primarily, but also uh, politicians and not-for-profit organizations and advocacy groups to really uh, work on initiatives to um, uh, help expand this narrative. And we, we plan on doing this by developing destigmatization um, campaigns or initiatives. Um, and uh, what that's going to look like at this stage, we don't really know. Um, we're going to co-develop this in our interaction uh, with uh, with some of these officials. Um, but if any of you on, on listening here today are interested, you can find out more information by visiting our website, emforall.com, um, and uh, you can uh, email us as well. So uh, to wrap up, and I, I'd love to, to make sure we have enough time for questions, um, essentially, uh, the community, um, the story that's been told is of a community that is targeted and indeed it has been targeted, but there's so much more to tell. And when we start to better understand the community, when we better learn from the community, then perhaps um, rather than scapegoating this whole pandemic to, to one ethnic group, we can prevent the unfair targeting of um, uh, towards um, ethnic groups um, when it comes to infectious disease outbreaks and instead um, recognize the important role that uh, they play. Um, so that's my uh, presentation. I'm happy to take your, your questions. Um, and uh, I thank you once again for uh, taking the time to listen to me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamuji. Um, that was a great presentation and I was really pleased to hear more about the, the idea of expanding the narrative. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, so now, um, as we know, it's time for Q&A. So if you do have questions uh, for our guest speaker, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to kick things off. I would like to understand the concept of social countermeasures because I don't think I cl I'm clear on what that is. And I'd, and I'd love some examples as well. You mentioned one tactic of, of like messaging, public messaging, um, but what, what, what are there other examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about how do we address um, uh, the pandemic, you know, there's a number of different initiatives that we can take. So there's medical countermeasures. So that includes things like diagnostics, treatment, vaccine development, you know, tracking the transmission of the virus. There's different policies that you can put in place. Um, uh, some of them include those mandatory mask wearing or um, uh, rules around, okay, if you're working in nursing homes then then, then you can't um, uh, basically work Work in multiple locations uh, at one time, etc. Um, and then there's social countermeasures. And social countermeasures are basically actions that um, are, 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 are focusing primarily on uh, changing the behavior of people. So, um, you know, individual actions can include, you know, stay at home when you're sick, hand washing, um, making sure that you, you, you keep your masks on. And then there's also community level action. So social distancing, interventions, community mitigation activities, but also this idea of reducing stigma and misinformation. So social countermeasures um, encompasses all of that. And when it comes to reducing stigma and misinformation, we have a number of 
examples from previous infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, TB, um, uh, uh, cholera, SARS, uh, where you basically are trying to create efforts in, uh, in order to address the stigma that people uh, might face. Um, some of that can include creative displays, uh, initiatives to get to know the community a little bit more, et cetera. So that's basically the realm of where we're, we're heading towards. Thank you for that. That's 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 um, interesting. Good to know. Um, now you focused on anti-Chinese stigma, but I'm wondering if there's other types of stigma that should be addressed through social countermeasures. Absolutely. So this is a that's a really good question because um, what we actually learned and, and and a lot of this came out of also our our. Um, uh, engagement in Nairobi is that whereas at the start of the pandemic, the narrative was primarily around um, anti-Chinese stigma. And that was what was, you know, uh, it was a, almost like a global discussion. And we saw that um, with our interviews in, in Nairobi as well and our research there. But then as the um, uh, disease has uh, uh, spread and as time has passed, we see that there's other forms of stigma that have emerged. So stigma towards um, uh, facing places of work, for example, so meat packing plants or businesses that have outbreaks, there's stigma associated with those. We've seen stigma towards people who work in the healthcare sector. Oh, you're a nurse or you're a doctor, you're, you're around people with COVID, I'm going, you know, I'm going to uh, treat you differently or I wanna maybe avoid you more than I would other, other, other people. Um, there's also stigma towards different um, actions like uh, a testing. I don't wanna be tested because there's a stigma around that idea or stigma around uh, families that have, you know, uh, of the bereaved. So somebody's passed away in your family from COVID-19 and now that, that family has been stigmatized. And all of those ideas, the harm that I talked about when it comes to stigma um, uh, is, is basically played out in each of these instances. So it's really important, we think, that um, when it comes to our response to pandemics, um, we think about stigma as, as something that really needs to be addressed um, in, with a concerted effort. And this is why we're hoping to engage with emergency managers and public health officials to ensure that it's part of our response planning. How do we deal with the stigma aspect? It's interesting, there really are so many parallels with the early days of HIV AIDS and, and just listening to your talk is all coming back to me. It's, so it's, it's, um, it's really fascinating. Thanks for bringing that up. So I have a question from Brad Lee. Where can we find the report of your initial findings? As a community group, can we discuss with you destigmatizing programs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so oh. At CCN, csj.ca, I'm not sure what that is. Um, we have two campaigns, Stop the Spread of Racism and Hashtag Face Race, thanks. Yes, this is the Canadian Council of, um, uh, Canadian Chinese Council, I don't know, I forget the name of it, of social justice. And we've been in touch in fact with, uh, with the organization um, and have highlighted the Stop the Spread of Racism campaign um, in our report. You can find our report at emforall.com. So EM, which stands for emergency management for all.com. You can find all our um, news appearances and all our, our presentations and reports there. Um, so definitely um, uh, hoping to collaborate with uh, CCNC SJ in phase two of the project um, once we launch that. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just ask one of the team to put that website, that web address in the chat for all the participants, uh, uh, or not the participants, our guests is what I mean to say. Um, so I have another question from Mingyu Yuan. Thank you, Dr. Marmuji, for this great presentation. I'd like to know, according to the interview results, how did different Chinese communities interact with mainstream media? Speaking for myself and my peers with roots in mainland China, we feel like being rejected by most voices in the media, not just because of the pandemic, but also historical and political reasons. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, it's really unfortunate because a lot of the stigma that the Chinese community has faced has also oh 
rooted in issues uh, with the Chinese Communist Party that people might have. And so there's a conflation of the government um, component and, you know, just the, uh, the general the population. And so that's something that we uh, definitely recognize. Um, but when it comes to new sources, um, in fact, when we did our interviews, we actually did ask all our participants uh, where they get their news, whether it's Chinese news media, social media, mainstream Canadian English uh, media, um, uh, international uh, channels, etc. And in our uh, future um, uh, uh, writing, we will be highlighting where that information was coming from. So in our in our outreach, for example, we definitely try to reach out to Chinese news media to tell them about our our. Um, our research and then also to share our findings and you can find all of that on our website emforall.com um, but definitely the sentiment about you know having the voices being rejected by mainstream Canadian newspapers uh, and, and news media outlets is something that we heard from our participants and so what we're trying to do when we talk about expanding that narrative and really encouraging politicians and, and emergency management to engage with the media is our small effort towards addressing that and um, uh, hoping that uh, at least it can be the start um, of a change there. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Vinny Krieger. Um, and it, I'm glad actually, Vinny, that you asked this question. Um, have you seen any racism at elementary or secondary schools and how are school boards dealing with this? Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. We definitely spoke to um, uh, uh, teachers as well as um, administrators of schools um, in the greater Toronto area. Um, and they highlighted the fact that there, it, there was racism um, uh, that was being faced. Uh, you know, especially when we had in the beginning instances of, of parents encouraging their kids to go to school with masks on, that's when we saw a really large escalation. Right now, things are a little bit different because um, some of those measures, everyone's wearing masks, people are socially distanced, so um, uh, some, some, some students are, are, are at school, uh, but they're at home. Um, so they're, they're, you know, there's less interaction amongst the children. Um, so it's, it's not something it's definitely not something that no longer exists, but it's just not as prevalent right now. Um, but what we are really um, worried about is when things come back to that new normal, when things are opened up again, what kind of backlash will members of the Chinese community face? Um, and so what we'll be doing at that point in time is probably re um, uh, conducting these, uh, the same type of, of, of uh, interviews that we did at the start of the pandemic, you know, at that phase and stage and seeing how things evolved. Uh, but uh, definitely, um, there are multiple reports, um, both news media reports, but also uh, academic studies, especially in the US that have looked at the impact on children um, and schools. And so uh, we acknowledge that that um, is, is a reality. So I'd like to hear more about, you mentioned earlier on um, about how stigma, one of the harms of stigma is that it can lead to non-compliance of public health, health measures. And that surprised me. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the ways in which stigma can lead to non-compliance is that uh, suppose, you know, we'll take the mask wearing example. So let's just say that uh, we are being encouraged to, to wear masks, but then when you wear masks, you're being stigmatized. So then you'll choose not to comply with that public health uh, measure or you're being told when you are facing any symptoms, sneezing, whatever, make sure you reach out, tell people, you know, we need to do contact tracing, then you're worried. I'm gonna now be stigmatized. I'm just gonna be quiet. Um, we've also seen instances with our interviews in, um, in Nairobi where some of the people said, because I'm so worried about going to mainstream um, public health, uh, mainstream hospitals um, or, or, or seeing a regular uh, doctor, I'd rather just rely on my own knowledge of Chinese medicine and deal with uh, whatever symptoms I have um, uh, given the knowledge that I have and experience that I have. So um, some of those you know, public health interventions that are being properly uh, like uh, um, uh, encouraged are just dismissed because you just don't want to be the, the the target of of stigma. That makes a lot of sense now. Thank you for that. Um, 
So I'm going to do one last call for uh, questions here before we wrap up. Um, all right. Oh, and I have one from Heather Cooper. I think it's important to talk to people who are not part of a stigmatized group to understand what might prompt a negative response. I suspect fear and misinformation. Uh, and dwelling on sensational and fear inspiring outbreaks from the media um, contributes to these attitudes. I'm not suggesting for a moment that racism just doesn't exist. I'm just saying it's important to understand people's thinking if you want to affect positive changes. What are your thoughts on that? Um, absolutely. I think um, speaking to those who are exacerbating the stigma, those who are victimizing, those who are, you know, have those uh, um, uh, xenophobic tendencies, it's really important to, to better understand that uh, from their perspective. Um, in our project right now, we've only uh, engaged with the Chinese community to better understand the impacts that they have faced. Um, uh, and what we hear from, uh, from, from, from speaking to the community is that actually there's, you know, um, there, there is a, a wide variety of, of opinions surrounding stigma that the community has faced. So some people will say, oh, definitely this is something that I've, that I've experienced and that worries me and I retreat. Others will say, um, you know, all visible minorities in Canada face something like this. And so let's not um, self-victimize. There's that, that, that opinion as well. Um, so there's a diversity of opinions within the Chinese community and that's what, you know, engagement with the Chinese community is what we've focused on. Um, and while we recognize that, uh, you know, understanding why people do what they do, um, uh, it's, it's currently not part of the scope of our project, but there's multiple, uh, research, like a lot of research that has occurred um, both uh, with surveys and, and um, with COVID-19 where you can find some information around why people um, react the way they do it. It does have roots in fear, um, you know, targeting blame, like who do I, uh, you know, um, who can I blame? I just, I'm so upset. I need to, 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 to vent and who can I do that on? Um, uh, and then also with previous infectious diseases, there's been a lot of research around why people stigmatize. Um, so while it's not currently the scope of our project, um, I, I recognize that that's an important thing to do. Thanks. That's, that's really interesting. And you've given us a lot to think about today. Before we wrap, um, do you have any final thoughts for, for us in the audience? You know, maybe what we can do to contribute towards destigmatization or anything yeah. of that nature? That's a really good question. And I think um, if I could say, what can we do as, as members of the general public is just not be so narrow-minded and focus on only what um, we're told to focus on by, by media and by what the general, you know, what, what's the general sentiment in the public. Um, there's so much more to stories that we need to um, unravel for ourselves. And it's at the, it's at the tip of our fingers. If only we took that initiative, we can learn so much more. We don't have to have, you know, attended this presentation to understand that the Chinese community took these early actions. If you just knew some if you, if, you, if you knew people from the Chinese community, you would know that some of these actions were taken. Um, and so I'd say uh, if I was to advise any of us, it would be that um, let's try and get to know one another a little bit more um, and not be so uh, blinded by the current narrative, because I think that happens a lot in all communities. It's not only about... Um, it's not only about the Chinese community, it's about, uh, you know, uh, many visible minorities, uh, socially vulnerable communities where there's stereotypes that occur, misconceptions, and all of that is because um, at the end of the day, the root of it is ignorance. We just haven't taken the initiative to learn a little bit more, to humanize our relationship with those other communities, to get to know other people, to expand our horizon and, and our thoughts. I think that would be my advice. Thank you, that's a really good advice, much appreciated. And thank you again for taking the time to be here with us, to share your research with us. Um, it's very, very much appreciated. Uh, my pleasure, thank you so much for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, and say, before we say goodbye to you in the audience, thank you again for taking the time to join us. And we have one last poll question for you. We're planning our Scholars Hub events for 2021. And we welcome your feedback. The question is, what would you like to see as part of the Scholars Hub at Home experience in the new year? 
And your choices are one, a chance to connect or have conversations with others. Two, a chance to ask my question directly to the speaker in addition to using Q&A. Or three, a choice to tune in live or watch later on demand. Um, that should be on your screen now and um, please take a moment to respond to that. Thanks for, for participating. And uh, as always, feel free to share this talk with your friends. It will be posted to our YouTube channel. You can also join our LinkedIn group and follow us on Facebook by searching York University Alumni. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at York U Alumni. We're always interested in hearing from you um, about any topics you're interested in hearing or any feedback you have about Scholars Hub at Home or any of our other activities. Please email us alumni at yorku.ca. And as a reminder, we have one last Scholars Hub of the Year next uh, Wednesday, December 9th, excuse me, today's the second, next Wednesday, December 9th at noon with Dr. Shana Rosenbaum, who is a professor in the Department of Psychology in our Faculty of Health, and she will discuss memory and decision making in the time of COVID-19. That should be an interesting one. After that uh, December session, we'll be taking a break and we'll be back in the new year on Thursday, January 21st, uh, with a special Scholars Hub edition about the US presidential inauguration. So to learn more about these events, visit our website, yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. Thank you all for being here with us today. And as always, stay safe, stay well.